Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Nanette Kennedy with Humanities Team and um, Evolution Revolution. And we have just begun last week Conversations with God, Book Four, Awakening, Awaken the Species by Neil Donald Walsh. There's the book. And we're going to put ourselves on mute. And Linda, our very wonderful reader, is going to begin reading. Okay. This is Chapter Four. Neil speaking. I know it may not seem like it from our actions, but humans really do want to survive. That's why we're crying for help. Most humans say that survival is a basic instinct. Actually, survival is not your basic instinct. If you all followed your basic instinct, the survival of your species would not be in question. It would be guaranteed. I know. The basic instinct of humanity is the expression of every human's true identity, which is divinity. In human terms, this translates to pure love, love that knows no condition and expresses itself at any cost. That is the fundamental impulse, which is why humans run into a, into a burning building rather than away from it if they hear a baby crying. At the highest level, at the instant when the most urgent decision must be made, most people don't stand there weighing the odds of their casual, of their survival while the baby's crying. They do what it is in their true nature to do. In moments such as this, you understand that there is no way you can cease to exist. The spirit of you, the essence of who you are, will live forever and ever. And at the deepest place within, you are clear about this. Survival, therefore, ceases to be the issue. It is not a question of whether you will live, but how you will live, whether it's for another 20 years or another 20 minutes. Now, it's true that you may have a strong desire to continue living in your present physical form for more than 20 minutes, but your basic instinct to express divinity by becoming the personification of unconditional love outweighs and overrides this desire. Sadly, not every member of your species experiences this level of clarity during life's ordinary moments. The number who do, in fact, is very low. It is easy to get lost in the labyrinth of life. It's only the most critical times when the chips are down that most humans act as if they are out of their mind, because they are, quite literally. They're following instead the impulse of their soul. But if humans followed the impulse of their soul in every moment, they would create heaven and earth overnight. They, would, they could simply do this simply by seeing every minute of every day as a burning building moment. A moment when we do, in fact, easily and instantly access the better angels of our nature. But this is what all those who have self-identified as choosing to assist in the awakening of your species are going to be doing. They will be following the impulse of their soul in every moment, and they will be encouraging others to do so, even as they seek to model how it is done. But remember, that yours is a very young species, and so not many of you understand why you are on earth, nor embrace the implications of your everlasting life with God. If humans imagine there to be any kind of everlasting life at all, most believe it to be some form of eternal reward or punishment, viewing the kingdom of God as a meritocracy, Thus, they have created a reward or punishment world, reflecting in physical reality an utterly inaccurate understanding of ultimate reality. Yes, yes, I know. We've talked about these false notions before in, in previous exchanges. Now let's get back to the point made earlier, which is that most of you would like your species to continue to exist in the present physical form, 
You want your children and your children's children to have, to have the same opportunity you've had, the opportunity to experience this wonderful physical planet, this special and beautiful environment, and this particular expression of life. Yet here is the irony. Even as you tell yourself that you want your species to continue and to improve its way of life, many of you do things that are making it very difficult. Well, not on purpose. No, not on purpose. But that's the point. Your species is not on purpose in the manner of how you are living your collective lives. Many of you say one thing and do another. If everyone could check their mute. And this is the most important matter facing the human race if you truly want to take advantage of this being the perfect time for advancement within your species, allowing it to continue to exist in a wonderful and pleasant version of physicality. Hang on. And we're asking for a little help here right now because our vision of physicality is not so wonderful and not so pleasant for too many members of our species. Most of the systems we've put into place to create a better life for all of us on this planet have not produced those results. Our political systems, for example, have produced continual disagreement and disarray. Our economic systems have produced increasing poverty and massive economic inequality. inequality. Our healthcare systems are not doing nearly enough to eliminate inequality of access to modern medicines and healthcare services. Our social systems more and more generate discordance and disparity to say nothing of a frequent injustice. And saddest of all, our spiritual systems have in too many ways and too many places produced bitter righteousness, shocking intolerance, widespread anger, deep-seated hate, hatred, and self-justified violence. Do you see what I mean when I say that you are already awake? You're observing these things clearly here. There are exceptions, of course, but the accuracy of your overall assessment is everywhere in evidence. Do we want I don't to, want to oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Do we, does anybody have any comments or questions thus far from this chapter? Okay. Go forth, Linda, okay. into the good night. <laughs> Five. I don't want to point to nothing but what's wrong, though. I want to talk about how easy it can be for us to change things with one simple shift up in our upshift in our collective consciousness. It will be easy. It will be remarkably easy. Yet you can't change things unless you know what it is you want to change. So some discussion of what's not going well can be very useful, allowing humanity to know where it may wish to make some improvements. This is especially true with people who hold a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil mentality and don't normally look at these kinds of things. Yes, but I can see apologists line up right now to say, wait a minute, we've made huge progress. They'll say that we have to look how far humanity has advanced and they will be accurate in assessing these, that things are not as bad as they used to be. So what would you say to them? I would say yes, but is that it? Is that the most we can say about our global experience? Things are not as bad as they used to be? Can we not at least also say our species has finally become civilized? Then I would invite them to be the judge and I'd point out things that, are, that not many people know or think about or want to think about, such as? Well, such is the fact that more than 1.5 billion people in this very moment do not have electricity in this 21st century. Such is the fact that a higher number, over 1.6 billion, 
do not even have access to clean water. Such is the fact that a much higher number still, over 2.5 billion, do not have toilets. Now, some of this may seem like simply inconveniences, but these conditions have enormous implications. More than 19,000 children each day die on this planet from preventable health issues, such as malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia. And then there is this problem, which we could solve virtually overnight if we really wanted to. Over 650 children die on this planet every hour of starvation. In the meantime, 85 of the world's richest people hold more wealth than 3.5 billion. That's half the planet's population combined. Many people insist that there's nothing wrong with this and, and that this final statistic has nothing to do with the earlier ones. So I would ask these apologists, what do you think? Is this a civilized species? And what do you think their response would be? Well, I've actually had this kind of discussion, and many people become defensive, especially if they're among the smallest percentage of the world's population, holding or controlling the largest percentage of its wealth and resources. They say that those who have are doing their best to get more to those who have not. Many of them, if not most of them, have done their best. It's not the individuals who are the problem. It's the institutions of society. It's how the system is set up. It's the economic structures and constructions. Yours is a young species still trying to find its way. Well, the result is that there are many who describe our species as civilized, in spite of the fact that we're still building and actually threatening the use of weapons of mass destruction in a global community that has found it impossible to create a way to simply get along. And I keep wondering, is this civilized? There are so many who described our species as civilized, in spite of the fact that we're killing human beings intentionally as a means of teaching human beings that killing human beings intentionally is not okay. And we fail to see the, uh, the contradiction. And I keep wondering, does this make sense? There are so many who describe our species as civilized, in spite of the fact that we still claim that a loving God does not want people who cherish each other to marry each other if they're of the same sex as each other, or even if they're not of the same sex but are of different races or religions or tribes or cultures. And I keep wondering, is this our definition of love? And there are so many who describe our species as civilized in spite of the fact that we're still brutally killing and eating the flesh of other living creatures and pretending that those creatures are not sufficiently self-aware to experience suffering in the way that they are raised and how they're slaughtered or that it doesn't matter even if they do experience suffering because humans have dominion over them and get to do what we, as we want with them, how we want, when we want. And I keep wondering, is this how we define the human species as humane? There are many who describe our species as civilized in spite of the fact that we're still smoking and ingesting known carcinogens ignoring how huge number of us are suffering from what we're doing to ourselves and that we're still abusing alcohol and drugs, pretending that these substances can, we can handle, these are substances we can handle. All the while, we're not handling them at all, but we're seeing these things alter our very personality, the root of our being. And I keep wondering, is this a measure of our intelligence? Well, these conditions presenting themselves in such an unavoidably visible, dramatically obvious way are what make this the perfect time for advancement. 50 years ago, even 20 years ago, before the vast expansion of the internet and the explosively global reach of social media, these condi conditions existed with far, few pe far fewer people noticing them. Well, I see what you're saying. The time is right for humanity to really be able to do something about all this now, because now everybody can know. Everyone, 
not just a few people here and there in activist organizations, academic institutions, or government offices can be aware of what the problems are and how widespread they are. Can you imagine 1.6 billion people not even having access to clean water in the first quarter of the 21st century on a planet whose inhabitants consider themselves to be evolved? So you're seeing that you can't solve problems you don't know about and that knowing about them and talking more and more about them is something you can celebrate because it creates the perfect climate within which conditions are finally addressed and solutions are create, can be created. Exactly. Or to put this another way, necessity is the mother of invention. I have enormous hope that the human venue will become one of the most successful and joyous expressions in the, of life in the cosmos. I'm clear that we are but one decision away from creating this. And what is that one decision? Hang on. Comments, questions? To me, that one that one decision for it is for us to just love each other, to see humanity as a family, and start living it and being it. This is true. I also think with all the world's calamities right now. Um, we're being put in a position where we still need to appreciate the good that's going on because it's so easy to get drained by all of the uh, hurricanes and terrorist issues around the world and and you can get bo bogged down with like oh my god and then I, I make a habit of getting up from my desk about 10 times a day and going outside and just say, and I can see the mountains from my house because I live in Colorado. And I just think I am so blessed to have eyes that I can see those mountains. Or I'm so blessed, even though bees kind of drive me crazy, that we have so many bees out right now. Um, and it, it's sort of like that song, Count Your Blessings Instead of Sheep. And um, if we can do that, when we start to feel that intenseness, and it doesn't mean like, I don't know whether it was Neil or God saying it a minute ago, um, that we can't discuss these issues that we have because it's important to discuss them so they can, the problems can be known like when Neil was talking about however many people it is that don't have toilets. Um, so I think there's, together I think there's ways, and alone, but I think together there's ways we can keep ourselves from jumping off the bridge. So anyway, that was what I was going to say. Over. Anybody else? No. Well, about the decision to love and the decision to feel gratitude and be positive, it, I think we have to do it many times a day because we all forget all the time. Uh, a weakness is like by moments, by seconds. And the task now is to try to remember as many times a day it is possible. And then it, it will grow from there. Agreed. The discourse is not enough. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Diane. All right.
Let's continue with chapter six. Okay. I believe that we can change the global experience of our entire species by making the decision to open-mindedly, genuinely, and unrestrictedly explore, and then open-heartedly, joyously, and unreservedly accept the reality of who we really are. Wonderfully put. And this will be an enormously impactful decision as it relates to your individual evolutionary process. Remember, what we're discussing here is not just changing world conditions, but changing the conditions in everyone's personal life and everyone's day-to-day -day experience. In fact, as noted before, this is where everything starts. This is where it begins. The third invitation is about how one's individual life is going, the way it is feeling, and what it is presenting as its next manifestation. You can be transformed self if you accept the invitation to awaken the species, because it is just as I said at the onset, outset, the fastest way to awaken the self is to awaken another. When you start focusing on this, you will realize that you already are awake. And this will make all the difference. It will change the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, and the way you choose to be in every moment and situation. That in turn will affect both what is drawn to you in your life and how you experience whatever comes your way. So now the only question is whether humanity will make that one decision. But I believe it can be done. It's not a pipe dream completely out of reach and utterly out of question. It is absolutely not. It is, though, going to invite and require a wonderful shift in individual and group consciousness, a quantum expansion of humanity's perception perceptive and perception, a towering and joyful rise in awareness. But to reemphasize, it is possible, or you would not be saying that this is the perfect time for advancement. Not only is it possible, it is happening now. You couldn't be having this conversation, and no one would be following it if such a shift in consciousness hasn't wasn't right now evident and occurring. The next step is for more and more humans to awaken. I understand the third invitation. I totally get it now. And so does everyone else who's tracking this. I expect that there will be many people self-selecting to move their own personal evolution forward by humbly lending their energies to the awakening of the species in whatever small, way they can through working on their own awakening. And to help all of you accomplish this, you are invited to turn to higher aspects of the one reality of which you are an integral part. Wait, hold it. I was just totally getting everything you've said here, and now you lost me. You are encouraged to notice that you are not alone as you face the challenges now confronting your species. Yes, I, I know that nearly everyone on Earth is concerned about this. There aren't many people on the planet who aren't worried about the future and trying each in their own way to do something about creating a better tomorrow. The challenge here is that we've tried so many things and we haven't yet found the answer. We haven't yet, as I've said, found a way to simply get along. We can't even find a way to stop killing each other. So maybe it's time to get help from those who have found a way. As I said, practically everybody on earth has tried and so far failed. Then turn to those who are not on earth. I'm sorry. Perhaps it's time to get help from those who are not on Earth, who know all about life on Earth, 
but are not from Earth. Whoa, what kind of a door have you just opened here? A door that has always been open. You simply haven't walked through it yet. Are we talking beings from outer space? Do you think there are such beings? Well, yes, I do. You even told me there were. We had a long discussion about them in chapter 16 uh, to the end of Conversations, book three. And what did I say there? Well, you said that there were many advanced civilizations in the universe. Not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands. You spoke extensively about how what you called highly evolved beings, for which we created the acronym HEAVES. And you described most of the underpinnings of life in highly evolved societies. Remember that you said this, because it's going to play a role in where we go later in this dialogue. Okay, I will. And what I wanted to say now is that none of what was shared previously about advanced civilizations elsewhere seemed outside the realm of possibility to me. None of it seemed far-fetched. We're in, after all, a huge universe. What does feel far-fetched is the idea that we are the only sentient beings in it. The chances of that must be one in a centillion. Actually, there's no chance of that at all. Of course, there are other sentient beings in the universe. They're all over the place. And these sentient beings are ready to help us. Is that what you're saying now? I'm saying that you need not think that you are alone in accepting the invitation to awaken your species. Well, we don't. You said that yourself. We've turned to you. We've knocked on your door. We've turned to God. Shouldn't that be enough? We turn to God and you tell us to turn to other life forms in the universe? Divinity comes in many shapes. The form that you take is one of them. So if you want to experience that God is helping you, look to yourselves and your own highest wisdom. But then don't hesitate to look at as well to all of the manifestations of divinity able to assist you. Don't look right past or right through those who may be opening the door in response to your knock. You really are talking about beings from off this planet, aren't you? I am. I'm sure that many humans will think that our help will come from the heavens, but not from other life forms in the heavens. It would be short-sighted to ignore or deny that possibility. So let me get this straight, because I don't want there to be any confusion here. You're saying that other life forms in the universe are choosing to help us. Some yes. Not all other life forms, but some. Not all other life forms are benevolent. Well, now that's a bit scary. Why? Even humans are not all benevolent. Many of you are not even helping yourselves. And you're actually hurting each other. Yes, but we're a very young species. And we've agreed that many humans are acting like children. You said that many of the other species of sentient beings in the universe are far more advanced than we are. That does not mean that they would in every case be helpful to you. Some of them are violent. Advanced life forms from elsewhere in the universe are violent? Some of them, yes. If, if they are so advanced, how can they still be violent? There's a difference between being highly advanced and being highly evolved. If people from 2,000 years ago could leapfrog time and appear on your planet right now, do you think that they would say today's inhabitants on Earth are advanced? 
I imagine they would, yes. And yet, are today's inhabitants of the earth not violent? Yes, sadly we are. So technological advancement does not necessarily mean advancement morally, ethically, consciously, or spiritually. Is that what you're saying? Point made. Do not assume then that all other life forms in the universe have chosen to be of help as you seek to awaken humanity. Advanced civilizations do not automatically equate to highly evolved civilizations. Would we even be able to know the difference? For, for that matter, are we even able to know that there are highly evolved beings choosing to help us? I mean, you're saying that here, but is it possible for us, those of us on Earth, to know this in our experience without freaking out? And even more important, how are these highly evolved beings helping us by hovering around us, literally or metaphorically, and, and watching over us to make sure we don't hurt ourselves too badly? by actually visiting us and, and working with us in a physical way right here on Earth, by planting ideas in our heads from afar? Good, keep going. These are not unimportant questions. And the answers? Well, the answer to all of above is yes. Uh, okay. I need you to elaborate. Would you, would you care to expand on that? We'll have to take your questions one at a time. Whatever works. You will know the difference between other life forms who are helpful and may not be helpful by feeling the vibration. Wow, what a new age answer. Excuse me, I mean, I'm sorry, but I can really already hear tons of people saying, what a sappy New Age answer. Feel the vibe, man. Have you ever walked in a room, a bar, or a restaurant, and decided within seconds that you didn't want to be there, turned right around and walked out? Have you ever put on a shirt or a blouse as you dressed to go somewhere, then took it off immediately knowing that was not the right one? Have you ever met a person or or felt an inner awareness that you are really not supposed to have much to do with them, or, or looked from the other side? Have you ever experienced love at first sight? Well, sure. Most of us have had at least one of those experiences. And did you not think of them as, and did you think of them as sappy new age experiences, or just a part of life? Thanks. I got it. So if we can feel the vibrations of restaurants and blouses or people, we can feel the vibration of other life forms, and we would know immediately which ones feel good to us and helpful and, and which ones do not. Yes. If you're paying attention to what you're sensing, you'll be able to make sense of it all. People who don't use the powerful senses are built into people who don't use the powerful senses that are built into all human beings, what you might call your common sense, make it all mixed up. And in frustration, they may call what they are experiencing nonsense. Well, that's a very clever play on words, but it wasn't a play on words. It was the use of words quite accurately to get across an important message. It may not serve humanity to dismiss what's being said here out of hand. Okay, but how would we even know there were such highly evolved beings helping us? Don't worry, you'll know. You won't be able to miss it. You might call it something else, but you won't be able to miss it. But if we call it something else, we won't know what it is. It's not necessary to know what something is 
in order to benefit from it. Have we already received such help? You said we won't be able to miss it. That puts it in the future tense. Are we just now starting to get this help? You are just now becoming more aware of it. But it's been here all along? For what humans call would call a very long time, yes. So how helpful has it been if it's gotten us into this? Your species has actually come to this at exactly the perfect time and in the perfect way. You've reached this choice point and gained the ability to see it as exactly that, very quickly in cosmic terms. And the conditions and circumstances that you abdicate here, in fact, ideal in that they now they are now sufficiently startling to make your future options unmistakably clear. So highly evolved beings have worked very fast, actually, and very efficiently, measured by the clock of the universe. I want to stop here for a second. Okay. Um, Going back to the previous chapter, let's see. In my book, it's page 2930. It's chapter six. Um, the way where God and Neil are talking about awakening other people. And I'm certainly not saying that I've got it all figured out and I'm completely awake because I'm not always completely awake. Um, but one of the things I think, I don't, here in the United States, at, at a uh, store called Walgreens, you can buy markers that you can write on your car windows. And I'm sure you can find them anywhere you live not Walgreens but the markers um, and each of us on our rear window of our car write something that has to do with kindness with being kind to one another um, that's got to be a start and it wouldn't have to be that long but you can find a quote off the internet about kindness and put it there so that everybody that's behind you has a chance to read this and say you know what maybe there's something to it they may roll their eyes they may be whatever but they're not going to forget that they saw that um, and I think if we do that or you know commit a kind to act whatever it is we want to do but do something that will inspire others and if a lot of us were to do that and if, if that would catch on I think that's one way we can without getting up on a pedestal we can help awaken other people um, any comments or questions on that that's a great idea. I love that idea I love that idea as well wonderful perfect so next our assignment for next week <laughs> is let us know what you put on your rear window. And if you don't have a rear window, what did you put on the sign that you hang around your neck? Yep, like that one, Alton. Um, that you put on a sign and turn around backwards if you're on a bike. We can be creative in this. Um, so there's one thing I think we can do as a start. Um, I used to do this all the time, and I don't know why I got out of the habit of it. But at one point, I had the, it's a Native American proverb that says, no tree is so foolish as to have branches that fight amongst themselves. And I was out of town, and I noticed that the woman behind me was taking pictures of my rearview window. And because everybody's got a cell phone these days, I mean, things can get passed on that way. 
Uh, but the interesting thing is, is when I stopped to get gas, the same woman stopped to get gas at the same gas station. And she said, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. She goes, it's a really great quote, but why not use our rear windows as a way to promote our quotes? And I was really into Twitter at that time. So I would put my Twitter handle at the bottom so that it was like a giant Twitter message. Um, I don't have time to, I, I like Twitter. I just don't have time to be involved with Twitter. Uh, now, as the next, uh, let me add something else to that. Uh, my daughter is a manager in a restaurant and she came over yesterday afternoon for a little while and she was talking about just how cruel some of the employees can be to one another. And I said, you know, I would just stop them and say, you're causing friction with the back of the house, which means the cooks and the dishwashers and blah, 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 with the front of the house, which is the one that faces the customer. And you get the front of the house upset, then the front of the house gets, can get their customers upset, and it's this big chain reaction. I said, I would just stop people and say, you know what? Part of your job is to be kind. And I just say that, you know. And uh, she goes, that would stop them in their tracks. I said, yeah, it would. So I think there are ways we can spread this information, even to people who may not want to be awakened. Um, but there are things we can do. Um, all sorts of things we can do. Like if you see somebody really mistreating somebody, you can stop, you know, poke your head in as long as it's not putting you in danger um, and just say, hey, you know, stop that. And I think the more that we spread that kind of energy, vibes, the more we're going to act that way in our own vibes. So that's what I was going to say about that. Anybody have comments or questions? Okay, and then where is the one? My book's so new, I just hate to have to write in it. <laughs> um, let me find it. Oh, it was where God says, have you ever walked into a room, a bar or a restaurant, and decided within seconds that you didn't want to be there, turn right around and walk back out? I was just wondering if anybody wanted to share one of those experiences. When I, I, I've had to, uh, a lot of times I have to go to city council meetings for this town that we live outside of. And there are times where I'll walk in that room and I can't stay. I just can't stay. I have to leave. Well, conversations, the feelings are the language of the soul. So whenever I'm meditating, trying to say goodbye to my ego little mind and pipeline connect to my soul mind, my big mind, where we all are connected, you know, at the place of the super consciousness. Feelings. And sometimes I actually put myself into a situation where the feelings are rough and tough in order to try and change it and lift it up and cause, cause some awakening. The main thing, though, is just keeping our hearts open and not being afraid, right? Like conversation says, fear is false, evidence appearing real. It's, it's a, fear is a construct of our own mind. Fear is something that we have been taught from day one on this earth by people that are so fearful. And love, unconditional love, is really the, the life force of the universe that we can feel within us. So, yeah, all that they're saying about transmuting of energies, feeling the vibes, it's so very real. But... Remember, we're channels of changing those vibes, too. 
that's a good point, uh, Alton. I'd like to add to that. Um, most of you have probably heard this joke, but there was, it's an old joke, so it has nothing to do with the hurricanes of recent past. But these people climb to the roof of their house, and a, a boat comes by and throws them uh, life vests, and they say, well, we don't need those because God told us that God was going to save us. And then, a little while later, a boat comes by and says, get in the boat. We're going to take you to safety. And they say, no, we're not going to do that. God said that God would save us. Well, the long st story short is they end up at the pearly gates in heaven. And they said to St. Peter, what, what happened? Um, I thought you were supposed to be there to save. God was supposed to be there to save us. And St. Peter said, God sent you a lifeboat. He sent you rafts. <laughs> you, you, you've got to be aware of these things. So instead of like calling it fear when you feel those vibrations, because I think, speaking for myself, I've, I don't know what I might have gotten myself out of, but I just had a feeling like, don't go down that street. Just don't go down that street. And I'm not afraid, but I'm, feeling that vibe and I'm saying for whatever reason I'm not supposed to go down that street or um, some of you know that years ago I was a restaurant manager where a regular com customer committed suicide and it was right in front of me and a bunch of people and I became from sort of like a PTSD thing I became afraid to be in crowded places because I never knew who was going to have a gun. And I'm sure people like on the subway in London from the day before yesterday are going to have some reflections, you know, of you know, who's got a, who's going to have the bomb. And I think if we're listening to our vibrations and saying like when you were saying Linda you didn't want to walk into that room of the meeting. I've been in, uh, I, I found out it wasn't for me, but I used to try to go visit prisoners in prison. And I, the vibes I picked up on were just so bizarre. And so I tried this other thing where I would sit out in my car for a few minutes before going in. And I would bless my heart and I would, you know, ask for God to be with me. And it was better. But I just figured that that one was not for me. It just wasn't for me. Um, I used to have the same problem when I gave out. I was a lay minister for the Catholic Church. So I would go to the hospitals and give people communion. And I would always feel good when I was done with it, but I was also really very apprehensive when I walked in because of the vibes that are in the hospital. Anyway, I was just wondering uh, about other people's experiences when you get that hit that says, nope, and when God mentions um, that a person, that you're not supposed to have much to do with that person, I have never been wrong when I have said, you know, I'm going to just be careful here. Um, and I have not listened to that instinct a couple times, and boy, have I been sorry. Anyway, I've talked enough. If anybody else wants to contribute. Real quick, real quick self-preservation, that, that warning that made awareness of a malevolent energy involved. That's key. That's important. I mean, that's part of the whole balance, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I had that too in different forms. Entering in restaurants and deciding I don't want to be there. Entering in meetings where I had to to be. In those cases I would sat and uh, invoke angels, imagine uh, a bubble of light on the week the on the people in the room 
and uh, trying to asking how to transmute the energy. The more vivid experience I have, I don't want give any details, but because you know this goes on YouTube after it. But it is uh, the uh, parents in the meeting school school meetings of parents, and they were there the the men and the woman. I had no problem with the woman, but I really didn't want this man near me. And uh, he would want to talk with me, and I would just go a feet further <laughs> backward, and further <laughs> backward. It was always very difficult. And uh, this family is very close to mine. And I've learned after that that he was raping his daughter, and he did for years. And I couldn't stand the energy of that person. And I learned that years afterward. Well, I think that's a good reason to pay attention to your um, the vibes that are around you. And it's I think it's a really good idea for the angels. And I do this thing where I say, I want all the angels and saints and people that have gone before me, crossed over, that want to be helpful to me, and of course, God. Um, and it, it puts me in a calmer place, but I've had things like that happen myself where I was to find out later. Um, that, you know, I had good reason to be feeling apprehensive. So I think when we do feel those things, um, and Wayne Dyer used to tell a story that I loved, and I'll just repeat it again, that he totally believes, you know, believed, still does, I'm sure, in God, and and he says, but God has also given us common sense. And when we get that feeling, he said, if I'm like in a city I'm not familiar with and I'm doing my morning run and I see what looks like a bunch of thugs down at the end of the street, side of the street that I'm running on, he says, God says, you know, Wayne, why don't you cross the street and not run right through that crowd? You know, and so that your common sense is listening to God and remembering that, and, and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you if you didn't happen to hear the message, but it's it's really important for us to all uh, figure out that uh, we can be watching out for ourselves and listening to the vibrations. Anyway, that's what I was going to say. Well, given that it's one minute before the hour, I think we should stop at the end of Chapter 7. And Chapter 8, um, we can uh, begin with next week. And I was wondering, too, uh, Sarah, if you could do me a favor. The day that you wrote down those ideas of things we could all do, with, and it started, out with, I think, with books, Bye, Linda. It started out with books. Um, if you could write me that in an email, what your idea was, because I saved the chats, but just la last weekend, I did something I've been swearing I was going to do for a long time, and I was going to start deleting all these videos off my computer because they're taking up a lot of space. Well, when you do that, it takes away the chat notes, so I don't have access to those anymore. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, thank you. It was a great turnout today, and I love you all, and Kirsten, and Angela, and Diane, and Sarah, and Alton, and Shabana, and Jacques, and Anne, and Linda had to get off early, and so did Christine, but I'm really glad you were all here. I will try to get... Um, I'm just waiting for my cat to hiss at your cat, Sarah, because my cat's right behind me. But um, anyway, we'll continue on next weekend. And if you can remember to try to find a good quote for the back window of your car, we could just make the world go around. 
in a better way than it is. So I love you all, and we will talk next week. Same time, same channel. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Love you all. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.